Good evening, everyone. So tonight is about a non-formal education setting. It's about uh, bringing industry to people that want to know about it. If you don't have or are not scared of coronavirus. So that's eight of you tonight. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Hope you get home safe. So I'm just going to go straight into then. So, well, actually, first of all, I should tell you that one of the speakers, Daniel, is not here this evening due to underlying health issues, and he doesn't want to get coronavirus. So that's three times I've said it now. Sorry, coronavirus. So I'm standing in as a world-renowned performing artist and songwriter and artist manager. So you got me, yeah. I'll hand over to these guys in a second. So we do have Ronell, who is a recording artist, composer, producer, musician, lots and lots and lots of stuff, which he can tell you about in a minute. Uh, and this is Matt, Matt Greer, who works for ATC Management and looks after lots of bands, including one that's playing here this evening by sheer chance. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what are they called? Half Moon Run. Half Moon Run. Okay, so um, over to you, Renal, if you can just introduce yourself and give a little rundown of what you do and who you are to these lovely people. Hey guys and girls, um, my name is Ronell Shaw. I'm a songwriter, multi instrumentalist, a producer, a composer, etc., etc. Kind of um, dabbling in a lot of different things. Um, I mainly focus on working between two worlds one being theatre in regards to composing and arranging, and then contemporary music, which is the songwriting, producing, and a lot of the session work some of the artists I've worked with and musically directed for or worked alongside are people like Maverick Sabre, Skepta, Rudimental, Anne-Marie, Carleen Anderson, who some of you may know, some may not, but um, amazing jazz funk, soul artist. Um, soul to Soul, people like that I've kind of worked alongside and been mentored by some of those people as well. And I think the one thing that I figured out quite quickly is the more I can do, the more I can work. And be nice to people if you want to keep working. So a lot of what I do involves people skills as well as music skills. So when musically directing, I try to focus on musically directing the kind of emotions of the artist first and then the band. And I kind of take skills I use in the popular music world and they seem to work more effectively in the theatre world. Little things like, you know, being able to write some songs for certain theatre productions that just feel a little bit less corny, to be honest. And to be able to put on performances with artists that can be a little bit more theatrical or orchestral. So that's, in a really quick nutshell, me. Yeah. Now, because we were going to have a bit of a format of Q&A at the end, it can be a lot more flexible, I think. Um, so just in case you forget questions that you might have for Ronell, he's just mentioned a lot of stuff. And obviously, you know, there are a number of you in here who might want to be self-managing or managing artists. And uh, Ronell said things about people skills and whatnot. Uh, actually, out of interest, where does punctuality uh, come into uh, that list of things? Oh Andrew? my God, like, just the thought of people being late gives me immediate anxiety. Um, because things run to a schedule and you know, the gig is going to happen whether you're on time or not. So ideally, if you're on time, you're probably going to get called next time I'm asked to MD something. So I try to be early because that way I can acclimatize to the space as well as um, maybe have to get involved in like problems that may have occurred. And I don't mind waiting around. We have phones that give us access to the world. You're really not going to be twiddling your thumbs. So punctuality is so important. It really is. And I'd prefer to work with someone who's friendly and on time, but not as good as the professional person who's very arrogant and very late. Not a professional, the highly skilled musician who's very arrogant and very late. That's just me. And I find, I mean, I've been fortunate to be doing this for nearly 15 years. And... What I've noticed is there's a certain set of people who are still doing it from when I started, and they are the nice ones. You know, they they seem to be the ones who will still get the gigs. Obviously, they're good at what they do, but when you get to a certain level, it's not about how good you are because you're on a tour bus for six weeks with someone, or you're touring for four months, and you have to live with these people. And if they don't like you, you are not getting the call again. 
unless you are literally Jaco Pistorius, who's one of the greatest bass players of all time, then you will always get the call. Yeah. He's not with us and he's still better than most bass players. <laughs> he's still better than most. Okay, I will hand over. So, uh, Matt. Hello. Uh, my name's Matt. I'm an artist manager at ATC. Uh, I manage a band called Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes and also Half Moon Run, who are coincidentally headlining at the Roundhouse tonight. Um, might be one of the last big gigs in London for a couple of weeks. Who knows? Kind of surreal. I've been at ATC for almost nine years now, doing all sorts of stuff. Started off as a scout um, and kind of worked my way around, managed to not get fired. Um, and wound up as an artist manager. Um, not something that 10 years ago I even knew was a job. I literally did not know what talent management was 10 years ago. Um, so it's quite sort of uh, quite a strange journey, but yeah, I love what I do and uh, very lucky to do it. Okay, so obviously, I mean, you said 10 years ago. When did you start out in your music business career? 15 years ago. Okay, so, so I am old because mine was 91. Um, so, I mean, you know, when people talk about their careers, they often sort of go back to a specific time, you know, whether it's things changed in the industry or how things were when they started. But if you can sort of go back to when you did start, what one, because obviously, you know, you talked about certain skills that maybe people don't teach you. You certainly wouldn't learn it necessarily in education. But what's one of the most sort of key things that's got you, you know, where you are, like other than what you told us. So if you were new at sort of, you know, right, I want to be an artist manager, I want to be a producer, what's the one thing that you sort of think back and think it's, it's this one thing that's helped me sort of stay doing what I'm doing? It's, okay, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. I've done some work with the Hackney Empire when I was really young. And one of my mentors took me to a comedian's house, Griffiths Jones, who was putting on like a, a kind of party thing where they were kind of networking and all that. And I'd never seen a house so big in my life. And I'd never seen so many famous people in a room, like in one room in my life. And that feeling of, I didn't even know that world existed. Like I grew up on a council estate. A lot of my friends were troublesome. And I think the only reason I never got into trouble because I was the kind of slightly cool nerdy kid with a guitar on his back all the time. They were like, leave him alone, he's cool. And um, I remember seeing this house and going, I didn't know this world existed. I want to live and be around this kind of people and this kind of energy in these spaces all the time. So it, that feeling kind of created a very quick moral compass and a very quick creative compass. It's like, anything I did, is this gonna get me to that thing or is that gonna push me away from it? So yeah, my friends are going out tonight, but is not knowing what happened at the party on Friday because I stayed home to practice um, a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if I'm better at my job, then I'll probably get into those rooms more often. If I go to this party, I might not. So it was a feeling for me. I created a very strong why and I found when, everyone has an opinion by the way, that's one thing I'm very strong on, even everything I'm saying is my opinion, take what's useful, disregard what's useless, seriously. There are, this isn't the 10 commandments of anything. And um, for me, what I realized was that basically having that strong thing, even when I didn't know what it was, I just knew what it felt like when I was in a, in a place, I was like, this feels like that time it really helped me go, okay, I need to learn how to songwrite now because that guy was a songwriter or, you know, if I wanna be around other songwriters, maybe I should be a really good musician so they can use me and I can learn how they got there. And I, I really had a strong why I wanted to be there. So when other people would sometimes have like gigs or tours and they're like, come and do this. I'm like, no, I wanna produce right now. I wanna really figure out what sculpting sound is about. And then when I decided I didn't want to do that and I did want to tour, it was because, you know, you're picking up little nuggets of things that are taking me towards this feeling of going, I wake up, I'm in that space. I'm going out tonight, it's in that space. So my one thing was a feeling, basically. Um, some people say have a very big why. I guess my why doesn't have a word. It's just when I'm in that room or I'm in that studio, I go, this is how it should feel. I like this. I want more of that. I don't know if that makes sense, but 
it's it's the quickest way for me to make a yes or no when your brain tries to trick you into going, maybe that's good for me, or what if that happens? It's like, but it doesn't feel right. That was always my thing. Still is my thing. Yeah. Matt, you've had five minutes to think of a good answer. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's the same. It's kind of like a feeling like um, I, I relentlessly used to go to gigs from when I was like 12 or 13 years old, <clears throat> and I loved that rush of you know going to concerts and seeing amazing bands and I found myself like being a I was kind of in the UK rock scene I was I went to see a lot of bands play their very first shows in London and then would watch them grow and grow and I, I loved being kind of a part of that growth and I'd kind of feel I'd get this feeling of you know I loved watching my favorite bands grow and grow and in a way I still have that same feeling with the artists that I work with because I'm kind of a part of that growth, and it's still it's a it's the same sort of feeling that I have now that I feel that I felt when I was a kid, I suppose. And and yeah. Cool. Okay, I'll come to you first on this one then. So obviously, your job, I think you might say that it's changed in ten years, but I know from the kind of traditional, you know, picture that people may have had of of artist managers. Is there anything specific that's sort of changed for you as a manager since you started, either in a good way, so like from an opportunity, you know, people talk about how the music industry has changed a lot. Is there something that's changed that's, you know, been beneficial for your industry? And has there something, you know, that's sort of made it more challenging that you can think of? Well, it's actually interesting you say that because I, I was digging through some old uh, boxes of like old stuff and I found a copy of Music Week that I got the first week that I started at ATC, which was sort of eight, nine years ago. And the front page headline was, digital music revenue overtakes physical music revenue for the first time. And I didn't think anything of it when I got that. And now I look at that and I'm like, wow, that's like actually quite a big, it's quite a big deal. Uh, and, and it kind of made me think about how far things have come, yet when you're in it, you kind of don't really notice the speed of change. It all kind of feels gradual. I think uh, when I first started, I was, wasn't as kind of in it as I am now, but definitely it was simpler in terms of like revenue streams. You know, as an artist manager, you'd sign a record deal, you'd get an advance, and then, you know, most of the music, most of the income would come from touring or physical or merchandise. Now it's so fragmented, which is great in some ways, because as an artist, you know, if, if you're, you have a lot of different routes to take, I suppose. But it, as a manager, it's also very challenging because you have to be on top of, you know, streaming revenue, uh, performing rights revenue, merchandise, branding, live. I mean, the live world has become so complicated now um, as costs go up and, you know, the world's a complicated place now. Like, the people who are touring, you know, there's a lot of people really hurting in the music industry this week is, has been brutal for a lot of people and being able to kind of overcome those challenges as the world becomes more complicated, you know, and in some places dangerous, uh, how, you, how you navigate that. But, um, but yeah, I think in some ways, yeah, it's easier, some ways it's harder for sure. So are you talking about, obviously, because of this, the sort of scale that, say, Frank tours on now, and I guess you've been with him for quite a while where you've seen him grow, so I guess you're, you're maybe talking about some of the things that you would deal with as a manager with an artist that is actually touring like internationally, often with much bigger artists. So can you give us an example of, you know, maybe as an artist manager, the kind of thing that even if you've been in the game for a while, you just don't expect apart from coronavirus. <laughs> but is there anything else that you just think that's a real learning thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think most of those kind of snap learning curve things have happened in the touring side for me. Uh, you know, I've had I've not, I wasn't in the crash, but I've had artists in bus crashes, uh, had terrorist incidents, change uh, touring stuff for us, you know, companies around us going bankrupt, us having to kind of uh, navigate through that. Uh, the coronavirus thing is definitely the biggest thing that I've seen uh, impact the music industry in the space of like, a week, you know, it's, it's changed potentially everything. There's companies going bankrupt left, right and centre already, you know, companies in America laying off three quarters of their staff uh, and were literally at the beginning. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. So from the doom and gloom, for you in regards to um, 
I mean, you know, obviously you've got a very, very different job to Matt. So, and I assume from a, you know, the different types of jobs in your kind of portfolio career, the different ways in which you might see money come in, you know, from producing, playing, composing, musical directing. Um, do you see the current sort of landscape as more of a challenge or more of an opportunity with what you do? More of an opportunity. You thought about that? Yeah, I did. Because um, there are always opportunities depending on your perspective. Problems are opportunities to find new solutions for things. You know, um, when you know when you spoke about in Music Week and you said digital sales had overtaken physical sales for the first time ever, you know, all of a sudden kids making beats in their bedrooms can go, yo, hold on, so I can put stuff up and people might check it out. You know, it's an opportunity and then there's an opportunity for some young entrepreneur to go, hold on, I can build a business around this. So I do believe that things are about perspective. Obviously, the first thing we all do, which is quite innate just as humans, is panic because it's about, the, you know, defend and survive. But actually, if you can pull yourself out of yourself for a moment and go, hold on a minute, this is what's happening, but take things for what they are. Um, what can I do? How can I adjust in this situation? Then it kind of gives you an advantage because the majority don't do that. Hence, there being no toilet roll in Tesco's. You know, people panic and stock. So, hey, if you know how to make toilet roll, there's a business. So I see opportunity. Yeah. So the analogy of toilet rolls and say streaming music or just music <laughs> consumption you know like my 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 sort of own experience is that um i was in a band that purely really i think you know there'll always be a physical element so you know sort of punk metal rock thing those kind of fans still like physical and you know there was a very um clear change when I was earning money in, you know, the early 90s, mid 90s, you get to the late 90s and those zeros start to drop off, you know, and I, like, you know, there was a very distinct sort of change for me. And, and, and then for the next 10 years, you just hear people of my generation talk about how bad the music industry is. And then if you look at the last 10 years where, you know, I suppose from a, a music company label point of view, they had their own dip and now you've seen it come up and... We're kind of back to square one, but just with streaming. So, you know, from what you've told us that you do, I assume that a lot of your kind of, you know, your living will come from working with people who make music, and that's where the money comes from. So, you know, again, back to the sort of the opportunity thing. Is it something that's a struggle for you to think, how am I going to earn money with my portfolio career? Or, or has it been, you know, a good thing for you from a, you know, like offering your services and people going, yeah, that's great. Or people going, just can't afford it. We've got to strip down on the band and whatever. Well, my, I do feel as things change, my services change. So the title may remain the same or similar, but there are a few things that I feel like are inevitable things. Uh, death, taxes, and change. You know, they're guaranteed life, everything else. I mean, I'm sure there are more things, but... Change is always going to happen. So if in your mind you always have a system of being like water, I'm not going to say who that quote was stolen from, but if you know, you know, then you're always kind of in a space of flexibility. So now, you know, I can jump in with this one, but I feel like a lot of young people make music in their room for people who listen in their room. There's always going to be a space for live music. Um, that space may decrease and then it may increase it it fluctuates so if there's a point where live music is suffering a little bit then how do you adjust what a musical director does do you direct bands in studios do you direct bands in rehearsal rooms or do you offer the services on how to um direct a songwriter or a producer on how to make a song feel live i don't know but you know there are immersive there are more and more immersive experiences happening there are companies trying to figure out how to bring the live to the two two places of solitude you know i mean when samsung was it samsung who first put out like the whole oculus yeah, thing yeah. with like a like you could get your contract and get a, an yeah. oculus you know what i mean people are literally trying to figure it out and seeing what 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 captures what what sticks so as an MD or as a songwriter or as a producer, 
I think I'm always changing. I'm always adjusting to it. Um, as a manager, how does that work in your... Well, I think you, what you've hit on is diversification, kind of. So, you know, take this coronavirus thing, maybe people cancelling gigs. If you're an artist who can charge people 50 pence to watch a live stream of you playing on something like Twitch, you know, there's some people online who, you know, could make a living off of that. But in so in my role with Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes, probably my main client, I'm very lucky in that the two main musicians in the band have very... Uh, strong kind of side hustles. Frank, the singer, is uh, he's a very successful tattoo artist, and we're actually helping him open a tattoo shop uh, in London, and you know, planning a lot of stuff around that. He's got a daughter, uh, so he has you know he has a family to support, and he's been in the industry for a long time. He's no fool. He knows that you know the music industry ebbs and flows, and with this, we're helping him develop a business which complements his band, but also if everything goes you know, wrong, he's got something to fall back on. Um, he's also tattoos quite a lot of famous people sometimes, so it's a good relationship builder for us on tour. We're at a festival, you know, I don't know, someone like Post Malone wanders into the dressing room and uh, Frank always has his tattoo gear with him. So we've, we've, de we've definitely, well, yeah, I mean, we've, we have, Frank has built relationships by tattooing, you know, people at festivals in their dressing room before, which has led to touring or whatever. So, uh, so that's one thing. And then Dean, the guitarist in the band, uh, owns his own graphic design company. He employs four people, uh, and he does web design, coding, merch design, product design, social media stuff for people like Calvin Harris, Rag and Bone Man, Catfish and the Bottleman. I mean, you name it. He's he's done stuff for them. So. Through that, he also does all of the band's social media and graphic design and stuff, designs all our T-shirts, but he's also got supporters and fans in all of the major label buildings. So, you know, if we're looking for a record deal in a couple of years' time, he's got a load of people who can go to their boss and say, hey, you need to sign Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes because, you know, I've heard their demos or whatever. So there's all sorts of ways in which diversifying your artist's business is really helpful. And I think also specifically with rock music, a lot of rock bands, I think, are suffering in today's uh, entertainment world because they're quite one-dimensional. A lot of, I think, there's, there's, a, there's an issue where, you know, I think to be really exciting in today's landscape, you have to be doing a lot of different stuff. And I, and I think that I'm, I think trying to promote that with an artist is really important um, to make sure that the music is not the only thing that, you know, they can do. And it also makes it more fun as a job. Like, I've, in the last, like, two months, done all sorts of stuff to do with property and tattoo and, you know, like, a whole other area of business that I have no experience in, but I've kind of been thrown in at the deep end. Um, and it's, uh, it's been like going to school every day. You know, it's been, it's been actually really exciting, so... So I think one of the significant things then about what you've just said is actually like a lot of your job is driven by your client and if that's that they want to open a tattoo shop and you've got to look into business rates but actually they're a successful rock musician then that's your job of that week, right? It's, it's to, make, to make it work, basically. Okay, so a few things that I think you sort of said, you know, this, this word that I think for a lot of people, um, particularly in certain areas of music, they don't like to be thought of as a product, they don't like the word brand, and they may not like the word marketing, but of course it's a huge part of now, you know, well, everyday life, I guess. So the online stuff and the social media, I mean, I follow Frank, um, I follow lots of bands similar, and that's been for me, I guess, the one thing that's really become very apparent is that people have to spend almost like a full-time job so much time, you know, that, that, that phrase always on. And some bands obviously do it way more than others, uh, but Frank is very, very prolific, isn't he? Online with the band. Like, how, how much of a, of a part of your job is actually controlling that, making sure that the right stuff goes out at the right time? Have you got people to do it for you? So, yeah, what, what's your sort of, you know, the online social media thing? Good, bad, neither, whatever. When I first started looking after the band, we didn't have budget to employ a social media person. So myself and the band were very hands-on with it. Now the band has become a lot bigger. Everyone's more busy. Uh, and the, 
social media gets more and more complicated as the months go on. Um, so, you know, part of my job is I have to delegate, I have to hire the right people. It was hard at first, but we've found a great social media company and they really understand the essence of what the band is about down to like getting all the copy right and everything. Um, and I've been able to just delegate to them. And so actually I, on a day-to-day -day basis, don't have a huge amount of involvement. Although I do check, uh, I check stuff, you know, check how things are going, see how, you know, fans are reacting to stuff. But it is probably the most important marketing tool. I think you always have to back up your campaign with radio and press and whatnot. But we have shown like through our own kind of data analysis, we sell like 80 to 90% of our tickets and merchandise through the band's Facebook and Instagram. So you can have all the press articles and stuff you want, but everyone is clicking to spend money through your social media channels. So if you get that wrong, you know, you're really losing out on, uh, you're really losing out basically. Um, but it is, it's really daunting. And even like with Frank, Frank has his own personal profile and it exhausts him, like it really, really does. And we have a social media company who run the band accounts and stuff, but you know, for some artists it is very, very draining. Um, always kind of feeling that obligation to be on and engaging your fans and stuff. So um, yeah, it must be very difficult. I, I don't, I wouldn't be able to handle it if I was a big artist with a big Instagram following, it would be very stressful, but. Renau, is it a big part of your Thing, or are you lucky enough to be able to stay away a fair bit? Or To be quite blunt, I hate social media, but I wouldn't ever deny that it, is, that it isn't one of the most powerful tools for marketing and awareness of your product. The reason I hate it is because I feel that at this point, it's with how new it is and how it works, it is, there, are, there are elements of it that are designed to um, prey on psychological and social insecurities. And we haven't properly monitored that in a way that we do with something like gambling, where there's an age limit before you can do it, or drinking, or smoking. And I feel like it's been given to people, young people, who are still in a very important psychological development part of their lives. Um, I feel like my generation will be the first lot where people will be able to go, oops, we did that wrong, let's try it better next time, and we'll figure it out. However, there have been so many opportunities that have been given to people who couldn't get in the door because of social media. So I would never go big X on social media. This is my, again, like I said, it's my personal opinion on how I feel about it. But as a whole, it has helped me get work. It has helped me connect with people that maybe wouldn't have responded or replied to certain things um, if they hadn't seen who follows me or how many followers. I don't have many followers, but you know, one is more than zero. So that's always helpful. And it does, it just, I just feel like it's still in a phase where people are figuring it out. Like you said, your artist is exhausted from using it, you know, from, from tapping on your phone all day or remembering to take a picture or remembering to use the right hashtag so the algorithms pick it up in a certain way so that you get a certain amount of likes or views because if you don't, then you think you're crap because you didn't get as many as you did yesterday. Like, make some music, you know? And it's, for me, everything is about balance. And I, I feel like right now there's an imbalance. I feel like we will find a balance at some point. We're not there yet. Hopefully we'll get there before Instagram becomes MySpace. Do you guys remember MySpace? <laughs> the dust. But um, so yes, it does have a, it does play a part in my career, but I choose to not let it control the direction of my career. Some people are comfortable with that. I'm one of the people who aren't. Marvellous. I'm going to throw it out. So does anyone have any good questions for these two marvellous people? Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, I wanted to ask you your, uh, about your opinion about something. Uh, what do you think, like, when you are, like, an, an artist producer, like, sort of like Disclosure or Muramasa or whatever, do you think you should keep your thing as, like, the genre, the directions, and, and build that and be constant with it, or change yourself as the industry is changing, you know what I mean? With the risk to lose your actual fan base, you know what I mean? I feel that, firstly, what do you mean by changing? 
because there's a difference between changing and adjusting. You can keep who you are and adjust. Do you think like it's better to, to kind of change your music and oscillate to the things that are working now or to keep the main idea that made you who you are? You know what I mean? Wow. Um, I think the first thing that came to mind, which is why I was kind of torn between two ways of, of responding to that, was I think of someone like Prince, who consistently changed his sound, his style, his name, but was consistently Prince. But, I mean, I don't know Prince, but just from watching, he adjusted to the times based on what inspired him, rather than, oh, this is happening, I should do that. And it felt like Prince was always at the forefront of something, whether, you know, whether it was 1999 or Purple Rain or one of my favorite lesser known albums, Planet Earth, which he gave away for free in the Daily, or the Mirror? The Mirror, yeah. And so he was always adjusting, but he was adjusting versions of him, which goes back to being comfortable with change. Basically the same seeds. The same seed, different seasons. You know? Okay, okay, I, I get it. I get yeah. what I mean. Okay. Cool. So the tree is the tree, but sometimes the leaves yeah, aren't yeah. there. It's still the tree. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I think like if you're an artist and you're gonna change your sound to follow the trend, then you need to be prepared with potentially losing your credibility and losing your fans. You know, in that in that way. Alternatively, some artists, you know, I think Muramasa definitely changed his sound a little bit on his latest release, but he was being brave. I don't think he was following trend. He was trying to change things up to kind of keep things exciting. And, you know, sometimes that might mean some artists have peaks and troughs in their career, but ultimately, you know, if you're true to yourself, at the end of the day, you can do what you want. Uh, I think it's dangerous to try and follow a zeitgeist, follow a trend, because quite often, by the time you catch up, it's already moved on. You know, if you think about... <clears throat> Uh, I suppose it's different with certain genres of music where some people can produce music quicker, but definitely you see it in rock and guitar music where you'll get a band that comes out, like 1975 is a perfect example, you know, 1975 are massive, and then about six to eight months later, you'll get a load of bands that are trying to sound like them, but they, don't, they can't release their music quick enough, so by the time they've done that, 1975 have moved on to another thing. And so you can see these kind of artists trailing behind, and I don't think, I don't think you want to be that. You know. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I just want to add to that, um, which was a very good point, actually, is a lot of the time when the singles that you guys hear come out, they were written or made or produced like months before. So something comes out today, you're probably here in summer 19, 2019, you know, and you're like, I want to sound like that. You're already trying to sound like last year. So to follow or to go with what's new, you're actually going with what's old. You know, <laughs> Car one. Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know like a lot of the sessions and stuff I've done, I'm, I'm hearing songs come out and I'm like, I have to kind of go through old iTunes playlists to go, oh yeah, we wrote that then. So, and then everyone's going, that's the new thing. We want to be like this, which is why, you know, do you. That's the most unique thing you can do. There's only one of you. So, yeah, man. Okay, um, do you want to pass the mic? Anyone else got a question? Ah, Mr. Coy. I know neither of you kind of profess to be social media gurus, but if we did have to just throw it back to that very quickly, what would you say would be the best way to kind of garner whatever attraction you have on social media and translate it into actual ticket sales to kind of build your core fan base so you can kind of actually get out there, maybe begin touring, maybe begin to sell some merchandise and actually do something with a group of people? Because a lot of us have maybe upward of 1,000 Instagram followers, for example, but due to the algorithms, like you said, maybe everyone might not see all of your posts, but the people who do see and interact with, with you as an artist or your creations, what would be the best way in your experience to kind of get them and get bodies on the floor? Uh, I would say get a mailing list and start using, you know, start building a, a super hyper engaged core, core fan base uh, and start selling out shows, 50 people, then 100 people, and then your 1,000 followers on Instagram will start to see something happening, and then they'll gravitate towards it. I think you're right, man. It's, it's really hard. Like, uh, social media is like pay-to-play right now. If you want your content to be seen by everyone, you have to either be super su like smart and savvy and have great content and know how to get it out, or you have to pay. So I think social media is great, but there are also some really good 
like fan acquisition techniques like mailing lists uh, fan groups on Facebook is another good one so um, although Facebook is kind of like you know it, it's I don't want to say it's old news but it's, it's kind of become its own thing there are actually now uh, like fan clubs on Facebook where people on those groups are seeing more of the content that they want to see if that makes sense so there's a British band called Idols um, who are, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them but they have a fan created Facebook group which has like 30,000 members and it's incredibly powerful now because if they announce a tour it sells out straight away because all of their fans there will just immediately buy tickets and so they've cultivated this like super engaged group of fans mailing lists are the same like if you can have you know a, a core group of really engaged people on a mailing list it's much more powerful than having you know, 5,000 followers on your Instagram who kind of don't, who kind of care, they kind of don't really care. Uh, so there's no, like, one way to do it, but I think definitely trying to build a direct-to-fan communication through a means like a mailing list or something is, uh, is a really, really good way to start. And actually, just to add to that, I mean, I know, Coy, that you're, like, you know, quite active as a performer, but I think going back quite a few years, a lot of people that I know we sort of learnt that hard lesson of the numbers across your social media don't equate to fans at gigs or sales. You know, and I think a lot of people sort of learn that lesson. I mean, the thing now about people, you know, whether you're in education or not, is there's a wealth of knowledge out there that's been put in articles and reports and published. And there's so much stuff now that you can learn from, you know, much bigger organisations like labels and management companies that have done really great campaigns with their artists, dug a bit deeper into how you use that data because it's there for everybody and it can become a bit of a full-time job which is why you might then end up you know getting a social media company but it's that thing of like putting in so much before you get a small reward but then uh, building on it you know and I think like, all bands are doing it now so it has to be done um, but it's about putting that time in or getting somebody to do it for you you know so so it's meaningful and valuable you know because of course you think, oh, I've got a lot of followers, so surely they're all going to come and see me and buy something, but that's not how it works, obviously. Did you want to add to that? Yeah. I would say honesty is always helpful. I think consumers are consistently getting smarter and smarter, and they can see, okay, this person's gone for this kind of thing. Oh, they've got the lighting, they've got this and that. Like, people know what perfect looks like. You know, before you'd see something, you'd be like, wow, they've got it together. But how many times do you scroll through your search and then, or even now you're on your stories and then there's an advert and it's like, do you want to be an entrepreneur? Do you want to quit your day job? Because people know these are the things people are thinking about. So naturally consumers smart get smarter, advertisers get smarter. There's a great South Park episode on that. I won't go into it now, but um, we're evolving. Yeah, very, very quickly. So, but the one thing that people keep coming back to is honesty. Jay-Z said it, real recognizes real. So, trying to be something for people to follow you and like you and da 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 I feel like it takes away an authenticity of the person you are, which then takes away an authenticity of your brand, which I guess when you get to the gigs, when you get to sales, you go, hold on, why don't the numbers that actually give me a living add up to the numbers on my social media um, because a lot of those people sometimes are following for the sake of there's an old Caribbean saying they say um, sometimes they just follow fashion which basically means you follow for the sake of following not because you're um, a core engaged um, you know a set of followers so I do think authenticity is important I do think not always trying to show and like I said it's my opinion show the perfect moments are you know, that's important. For, if you want people to see the real you and genuinely believe like this is someone I can relate to and connect with and I want to see their journey and I want to support, then show them the human, you know. When you see a picture with, you know, friends all smiling or perfect food, like no one's food is that perfect, no one's holidays are that great all the time, but that's all we ever see. And even consumers are going, hold on, we know that's not that perfect all the time. So I'm not saying put up a picture of you just as you've woken up, but if there's an element of realness in a lot of what you do, I do think that helps add to growth. 
I'm not going to say I'm an expert on social media in any sort of way like that, but from the artists I work with and the conversations I have with them, um, one thing, Anne-Marie is a perfect example. She's a very honest artist. You know, sometimes it's the glitzy, glamoury photos, and then sometimes she puts up a picture and she goes, look, I've got a spot. And it just allows some of, from what she says, you know, some of the girls who feel like I've got to do so much work to look pretty just to go to school, to go, hold on, if Anne-Marie doesn't have to do it, neither do I. I really like her for that, you know? So, yeah, I do think truth and honesty is really, really helpful. Yeah. Cool. Do we have another question? Good man. Yeah, I'll bring that mic over. So, how would you go about uh, launching a side project which is not related to music directly? And, uh, like, you don't like... Because I, I'm interested in, like, launching something that's, like, just more than music. And, like, how would you go about to just doing that? Like, I have friends in, like, some of the... Um, um, like, the industry I want to tackle, but, like, how do you get in without any knowledge? Do you want that one? Yeah, because I think you were talking about like launching uh, a tattoo shop. Yeah, a tattoo shop. Um, so, with the tattoo shop, like I did some research, but also through some of the skills that I picked up doing management, I've learned about sort of event management and a little bit about property and stuff like that. But also, I was lucky in, I'm lucky enough to have people who I work with, like lawyers and accountants and people like that. Our account, the, the band's accountant, gave me a huge amount of advice because. He, this guy Colin Young, he looks after some of the biggest artists in the world. And with those artists, he's overseen them buying houses or building studios or all sorts of stuff. So I had a meeting with him and I said, hey, we're, we're, we've got this idea. And he was like, cool. And he just went, da -da 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 -da, you should do this, talk to this guy about the insurance. And, and so before the meeting I had with him, I didn't know very much. By the end of it, he'd given me a whole lowdown. Uh, and so then I had to kind of just go ahead and talk to people. And I think that that's one of the things as a manager, if if you have a skill at just kind of finding out who are the right people to talk to, you know, people are always willing to give you advice or, you know, give you some insight into some, into some experience that they've had. And so I think it's really important to just like talk to people, a lawyer, an accountant, uh, maybe someone else in that field and just ask for advice. I think, you know, people are always willing to give advice and stuff. On that note, can I just ask, so... Are there any people in here that actually do want to go into a career as some sort of like management? Because it's not, you know, it's not sort of artist management necessarily anymore. It can be music management across the board. So is there anyone that wants to go into music management? Like not managing themselves, but maybe starting up a company or managing other people? Yeah? Two? Three? Yeah? What about four? Uh, what, what about... Half, Pedro. Uh, what about the self-management of your own affairs? Are there performers and composers in here that think, I want to take control of my own stuff before I hand it over to others? I mean, of course, Lua. Yeah? Okay, a couple. Um, so, I guess in regards to... like, Sometimes when you speak to people maybe like us, we might have spent years and years through different channels uh, making those connections, but I remember very early on in my own career, my thought was, how do I get to know any of these people? How do you start banging on those doors? What's that point where you move from, I don't know anything or anybody, to, ah, okay, there's that one little step, that one link. So what piece of advice would you give people who are just thinking, well, I might know a bit of stuff, and I, or I might be a great artist, but what's that first step that you make? Is there anything specific, if I come to you? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is I'm not going to say just get out there and network because that is what everybody says. And it's not that it's not true, but it's just not that helpful. You're like, all right, well, I'm out there. What the hell do I do? So I took that and I took the frustration of that and went, well, um, being out here hasn't worked as quickly as I thought it would, which is one thing you have to accept is things take time but I do feel like having a plan helps. So actually, what do I want from this? You know, um, why do I want to be involved in this? And with what I have and what I know, how can I use it to be effective in my circle? And how can that 
begin to expand. You know, put real words and real ideas and real timelines. It's a business, you know, and sometimes the bit that gets forgotten about the music business is the business. And it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, down on exactly how PPL and PRS and all these things work, but having a plan, like, you know, a life plan even, is really helpful. So I do feel that knowing what to do with what you have now can open doors. And then where you take that, be comfortable to adjust into different avenues. So when you network, why are you networking? What are you trying to do? Are you just trying to meet anybody? Or is it someone who's going to be, you know, if you have a, if you have a focus, a why, a feeling, whatever, then you can immediately go, this is for or against the path I'm trying to get on. And then you can find the things that you're missing as well. So like I said with myself, when I knew I wanted to get involved with playing for other musicians, I realized, well, just wanting to isn't good enough. So who are the people who are doing it? Where are the jam sessions? I'm not going to get up and jam. I'm going to watch and see, well, that guy, he keeps coming back. So they like him. What's his name? Oh, wow, he plays for that artist. Okay, what does he do that I can't do? And then acquire those skills. And from that, find myself in similar positions by maybe saying, hey, are there any people looking for a guitarist? Can I get involved in this? Doing things for free, I find is helpful because it's not actually free. You're giving the most expensive thing you have, which is your time. And you're investing in, in kind of letting people see what you can do. You're letting yourself see what you can do and figuring out what you need to improve on to be as effective in as little time as possible. Because that's the other thing. Be good and be quick at it. Be friendly, but be quick at it so that people can go, he didn't waste my time, she didn't waste my time, I got great product from that person, let's call them back. And that's just using an idea of going into the world as a session musician. Eventually you'll be able to go, well, I know I can do this quickly. I feel like I, I'm, I'm definitely valued some kind of equitable remuneration, which is a posh way of saying pay me. And then you start to go, well, this is what I did anyway. I was able to go, well, would I prefer to do this for 50 quid or stay at home and practice and learn more stuff? Because my time is valuable. I'd prefer to stay at home. How about 100 quid? How about 500? Okay, I'll go and do it. You start to, you know, it helps finding ways and methods to balance what you find your value to be. So did that answer the question in a very long-winded way? Okay, let me leave it there. Some icing on the cake, very good. So Matt, for any sort of budding artists, what are you going to say to them tonight to make them go, that's what I'm going to do? What? I don't know uh, how I'm going to answer that. But to, to kind of follow up on your point about having a plan, it's like a really small detail, but it was something that actually made a really big difference for me was like networking. Sometimes you go to networking events, maybe you meet some people, or maybe you go to an event and you know there's someone, at a, like an A&R or a lawyer or someone who you're going to meet, planning what you're going to say, thinking rather than just being like, oh, hey, uh, nice to meet you, uh, and not really having like a purpose, um, actually thinking about, okay, these are the three things that I want to get out of this interaction with this person and actually investing the time into that because then all of a sudden I found I was getting way more out of meetings with people and also it made me look like I was being decisive and I knew what I wanted even though like I didn't know what I was doing but having, having a bit of a plan even on those micro interactions with people does over time, it does add up and so I think that is quite an important thing to focus on. I don't know. Okay, so there is a theme, obviously, about you know planning, being proactive, etc. All those kind of soft and transferable skills that we talk about. Right, so we got time for one more question before we wrap it up, and Matt has to go upstairs and see his band. So, yes, good man. Hello, um, I wanted to ask a question to Matt about. You said you started out as a scout. Uh huh. Right? Um, so we know that like nowadays major labels are investing loads of money on A and R. Yeah. Um, are you as a company like um, investing on A and R? Is it something that are you always on the search for new talents? How is they? Um, I think the when I started out uh, scouting, um, the landscape was a bit different. So uh, you know people would put stuff on SoundCloud and it would start to get buzzy through the blogs and that kind of stuff and we'd always go out and see new bands playing gigs now you know people 
major labels have armies of people in offices who just spend their time scouring SoundCloud. So you have to be on stuff really early. I personally have never picked up an artist just through finding someone on, online, but plenty of people have. Um, I think it's about you know keeping your ear to the ground, always listening to new music, but also speaking to people who who are in that kind of frame of mind. Like to be completely honest, like I don't always have the time. You have to invest a lot of time in. That's why people are employed as scouts because it's time consuming. You're trawling through blogs, listening to tons and tons of stuff, a lot of which isn't going to be great or what you're looking for. So for me, I invest a bit of time, but I also keep relationships with people for whom that is what they do. And so then it helps kind of filter, you know, out what might be interesting to me or, or what might not. Okay, I lied. One more question, but this time for Renel, from from a band member, from a performing artist who wants to get to that next level. Ah, Lua, is that you there? No? One last question. Anyone? Somebody that wants to be a successful, paid performer, producer, songwriter? What, what you say is the hardest part about touring and organizing and planning everything. Sorry, say that again? What, what, what you say is the hardest part about touring and the whole process of organizing it. The hardest part of touring and yeah. organizing it? Yeah. Um, I don't have to organize the tours, mm -hmm. luckily. Oh, no, but I mean uh, musically directing just, the, the whole... Okay, so like putting the, 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 the gig together yeah. and stuff. Um, excuse my French, but not losing your shit when you've got to work with artists. Because, you know, sometimes you see some stuff and you're just like, come on, be on time, know your lyrics. It, you wrote the song. Um, it's hard to really kind of keep a smile on your face sometimes because you're so passionate about being involved in this industry. And unfortunately, sometimes you work with people who don't care as much as you do. And you have to really kind of check yourself and go, I've been paid to be in the room to do a job, deliver the job. I find that is quite difficult sometimes. The rest of it, it's hard, but it's easy because I love doing it. So, yeah, you can do 18 hours sometimes trying to get stems together and clean things up or program things because the synths don't sound as clean as you need them to. But that's OK. I think the hardest part is always working with people who have been, um, I'll say this politely, put in positions of success, but don't really value it the way you do. That's difficult. So... Invest in yourself, so if those people ever come into your lime limelight, um, you have your own thing doing as well, and you can go, well, psh, when I'm done that, I'm back on me. Yeah. So can I just say, for those of you that have come, thank you ever so much for coming. I think it's been a really good panel with some fantastic answers and some insight into uh, two people that are very, very good at what they do. So can I have a little round of applause, please, so they don't get too embarrassed. <laughs> Um, and can I just say, I think what we're going to do is give it a few minutes of uh, Miguel on the ones and twos, and then we're going to have Lua. So please don't go too far, and you can sit and watch the fantastic Lua uh, and her band perform. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.